CVS Health is down 30%. The stock has fallen so much in the recent months that you can actually buy the stock and get Aetna Healthcare, the $69 billion acquisition that they completed in 2019 for free. I'm gonna show you how to buy this stock right now. It's actually a BOGO. You buy one, you get one free. Ready? Let's get to work. Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for the channel and all the comments. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I really appreciate that. We're gonna take a look at CVS House. We're gonna go through the cash flow one page. I'm gonna pull up the cash flow club. We're gonna dive through the detail. Uh, this stock has fallen from a peak of value of about $200 billion in enterprise value. It's currently trading at about 150 billion of enterprise value. So that decline in value is enough to compensate for the entire purchase price of Aetna Healthcare that they uh, that they purchased for $69 billion in 2019. Here's the article. <clears throat> they bought the two companies to become a health giant uh, over the years. And at, as a result of that acquisition announcement, the stock rallied for a while. Earnings grew, revenue grew, they took on a lot of debt. But over the subsequent several years, this company has uh, done a lot of remarkable features, but has not been respected by the stock price. And right now, you can buy that stock at a great discount, in my opinion, uh, and it's basically giving you Etka Healthcare for free. Let's get into the work here and f go through some more detail. All right, so we're in the cash flow club right now, and we think this stock is a long-term trifecta opportunity. David's released his analysis. We've got some guidance here that the company has reaffirmed this year's so role, but almost halfway through 2023. The company beat expectations, but the stock price fell itself. So the guidance here is revenue between 333 and $340 billion, cash flow from operations about 13 billion, and CapEx is about $3 billion. Uh, some of the highlights you can see, just copy and pasting some of the guidance. And then I wanted to show you a couple of charts. This is a really interesting one here, just the cumulative over time, how the stock has performed. Uh, from almost, you know, basically zero on an adjusted spread basis up to $100 or more per share. In terms of a relative percent, uh, had you bought this stock in the 70s, you're up 16,000% since then. So that's the power of compounding. And this stock is a multi-location retail play. So they have lots of individual pharmacies. They sell um, both pharmaceutical drugs as well as convenience store. Um, you know, food, milk, that kind of stuff. And what they did is they laid on Aetna on top of that to become more of a holistic healthcare provider with lots of multi-retail. Very, very interesting story. So before we dive into the cash flow one pager, we want to take a look at the five key attributes that we use on this channel to evaluate securities. This is basically a starting point. If you can pass these five uh, key factors, you warrant further due diligence. Number one, we want to see stocks with top line revenue growth. Number two, EBITDA earnings, enterprise level earnings must be growing. Number three, strong free cash flow, that's the name of the game. Number four, low debt, that's less than three times debt to EBITDA. And number five, you want a well-priced stock. What is a well-priced stock? Well, it's basically a stock that with a conservative growth forecast, you are estimated it will beat the stock market. That is our definition of a well-priced stock. And let's see if this CVS meets that criteria. Let's dive into the cash flow one page that you can get at cashflowinvestingpro.com. So here we go. 2013, the stock made $126 billion of revenue. And that revenue has grown on an average rate, top line revenue growth of 11% consolidated average growth rate of CAGR over the last 10 years. That means on average, every single year over the last decade, the revenue of the business has grown 11% annually. So to uh, 126 billion dollars in revenue in 2013 to 139, 153, 177, 184, 193, 255, 267, 290, and 321. They're expecting 333 this year uh, or more. Uh, and recent quarters, they actually beat their numbers. So this stock continues to march forward. And what I like about looking at 10 years of data is it smooths out a lot of the accounting transactions, a lot of the management's discretion within earnings, and it gives you a much more holistic view of where this business is going. Because don't forget, you and I are equity buyers. We're going to buy this and hold it for 10, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, who cares what happens in a quarter? Why people take a particular quarter and then from that extrapolate out in the future, it's meaningless. 
You want to look at a long, long time. You want to look at management. You want to look at underlying economic factors that that's, this company lives in to kind of feel for what the future looks like, even though it's very unpredictable. So that's revenue. Revenue is growing. We can check that box. EBITDA, enterprise level earnings. Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. You can use operating income, by the way. You can use EBIT here. Um, you can even use net income if you look. The, 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 this column could be substituted for a number of other P&L items, so long as A, you're not using per share data because that can be manipulated by the number of shares outstanding. You want to use a whole number. So EBIT, operating income. I choose EBITDA simply because as an investment banker with that experience in my background, I'm used to seeing transactions displayed on a e multiple EBITDA basis. And a lot of companies, when they, make, when they acquire other businesses, they will release the purchase price as a multiple of EBITDA. So it helps me get a gauge for what is the free market paying on a, on a public basis, on a private basis for companies. And it lets me gauge it with what I'm seeing here. That's why I use EBITDA. EBITDA is not a perfect uh, solution for cash flow by any means, but I don't think there's anything that's perfect. Uh, so that's why I use it. But EBITDA was uh, $9.8 billion in 2013. That went to 10.7, 11.7, 13, a little dip, 12.2, 12.7. Now back up 16.1, 18, 18.5, and 19.6, almost 19.7. They should beat that number this year, even though, uh, because numbers are coming in a bit stronger than they thought, even though costs are going up. Now, you'll see an inflection point in here. In, in 2018, right, the stock moved up a lot. You got 12.7 billion of EBITDA, spikes to 16.1. That is the acquisition of Aetna. So you kind of want to look before and after that. So after that, they grew from 16.1 to 19.6. So that's definitely strong growth right after the consolidation. I expect that, we expect that to continue. How fast, who knows, but we'll put a conservative number in and hopefully it pencils out. Debt. Debt has also grown. The acquisition that they made um, has grown a lot. I will say that this is a multi-location retail business. And as a result, they sign lease agreements. Lease agreements, according to Gap in 2000, I think 19-ish time, have to be capitalized. That means you take the full duration of the lease, if it's 10 years, five years, whatever it is, there's a math equation that says that lease has a debt obligation of X. You put that debt on the books, you put that as an asset as well, so it balances. But that is also one reason debt has grown so much from 12 to 70 billion. A, you have the acquisition of Aetna for seven, uh, $70 billion. But B, the forced capitalization of leases that were already in existence here gives an illusion of debt growing that isn't exactly right. Let's skip to the balance sheet quickly and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, balance sheet time very, very quickly. Quick, quick smell test of the balance sheet. 2022, last fiscal year, consolidated balance sheet for CVS. Let's scroll down into the liabilities section. Long-term liabilities, long-term debt, $50 billion. That is bank debt. That is, that is collateralized by the entire enterprise. Then you have operating lease obligations, $16 billion. You also have the current portion of debt and the current portion of lease ob obligations. These four make up what is debt on the sheet. However, only one of them, the bank, the long-term debt is a bank note that's collateralized by the entire obligation, by the entire enterprise. This is very important. On multi-location retail businesses, the way they operate and they should operate is that every single business Every single retail location is its own limited liability company. And they silo the rent agreements um, and uh, yeah, the rent agreements to those entities. So if, if a store is unprofitable, let's just say, and they need to get out of the, they close the store, but they've signed a 10 year lease agreement, they can bankrupt that one particular entity and then settle with the landlord and not have to risk the entire organization. That's the difference between capital lease obligations and bank debt. Bank debt is collateralized at the parent company and has overarching collateralization on everything. So if you default on the bank, it has an imp impact on the entire enterprise. If the management is doing their job correctly, they are not corporate guaranteeing the individual rent agreements at the LLCs. So if one struggles, you can, down, you can, you can bankrupt that. It gives you more negotiating power over the landlord because their claim is isolated to the individual LLC store location and not the overall enterprise. That's why 
debt is different between operating lease debt and bank debt. You want to take a look at bank debt. Now, what I show you here is full debt. This is both capital lease obligations and debt, which is what you're supposed to do. But realize when you look at the multiples over here, 3.5, that, that includes lease obligations, which are con con confined to the individual LLCs. At least that's the way management is supposed to be siloing risk. But I digress. Uh, lease $13 billion has grown to $70 billion. Now, the most important thing, in my opinion, here is that the, the debt peaked at nine, $90 billion when they made the acquisition of Aetna Health. And the company acknowledged that their debt, their ratio was too high. 5.6 is above our three times market, multi, three times debt multiple that we use. They acknowledged that and they've been buying down the debt. Look at what ha has happened to the debt in the last four years, they've paid down $20 billion of debt. That is a remarkable feat. And you can only do that, A, by issuing shares of stock and then taking the sale proceeds and buying down debt. <clears throat> they did not do that. Or B, using free cash flow that the business generated to buy down debt, which is what they did do. And that means that, means that once that debt is stabilized, that free cash flow goes to you and I as a stock owners. So that is value creation. And that is what the market is currently ignoring. I've seen several st uh, stories on, um, on Seeking Alpha and other stocks, people blogging about the debt level at CVS. And I think what they do is they simply take this number, $70 billion, and they think, oh my God, it's $70 billion, it's way too much. They're not looking at the detail. And if you read the 10Ks, if you do your own due diligence, if you slow down, you will find value in this market that no one else sees. Number one, $70 billion is not all bank debt. It's $50 billion. Number two, quoting debt without quoting the ability to pay debt is a meaningless statistic. Who cares if it's $50 billion of debt? If you don't tell me how much earnings they make or how many how much assets they have i have nothing to compare it to it's like telling me the united states has seven has, has 30 trillion dollars of debt okay well that's a big number what's the income like you have to have debt relative to something so in cvs case 50 billion dollars of bank debt while a big number is not a big number when i tell you it makes 20 billion dollars of ebitda every year or 15 billion of, of free cash flow from operations suddenly 50 billion against 20 billion is 2.2 times or so. So our debt ratio is actually less than the three X. So you want to be careful when you read articles where people try to sensationalize or clickbait you into, um, uh, well, clicking uh, and slow down. Excess cash, excess cash for me, I use the cash that's in the um, investment uh, line, uh, not the cash, but the sh short term investment line on the balance sheet. Because, in my opinion, as a CFO, if, if I'm going to put cash into that bucket, which is a, it's, it's basically not in your checking account, that to me is cash that could be released from the business and not impact the operations of the business. So I can consider that excess. By the way, excess cash, the reason it's here is because it should be dividend or used to buy back stock or something other than just sitting on the balance sheet. Market cap, shares outstanding times price. I use fully diluted shares. In some businesses, it doesn't matter, but some other tech businesses or businesses that use convertible debt, it absolutely matters and you need to use uh, fully diluted debt. That basically says all the stock option grants that have been issued, all the debt securities that could be converted into stock at the election of the debt holder, all of that is assumed to have been executed and dilutes the shares you and I that are buying. Uh, most companies don't, uh, most, most of the stock analysts use uh, the, the weighted average stock, which does not include the dilution that happens if, option, if, if the business plan succeeds and options are exercised, there's going to be more sh uh, stock in the market and the stock price will come down. So you want to use fully diluted shares. If I add debt and market cap and I subtract excess cash, I get enterprise value. Enterprise value is the true value of a business. That business has gone from basically 100 billion prior to the acquisition of Aetna. So this is 2013, we're at $97 billion, uh, 121 billion, 135, 112, and 100 billion. So prior to the acquisition, 
This is averaging about $120 billion of value, enterprise value. Then after the, the, uh, the acquisition, it spikes to 144, then goes to uh, 183, 174, and a high of $203 billion. So if I look at this gap between the peak 200 billion and roughly 110, 120 billion of value prior to the acquisition, that's about $80 billion or so of value that the stock ran up after the uh, with, with the acquisitions. So that's fully accounting for the Aetna uh, acquisition. But now you look, the stock fell back, the enterprise value fell to $193 billion as of the December last year. And if I look right now, the stock's roughly $70 a share. May, turning that into the enterprise value by multiplying times fully diluted shares, adding your debt and, and, and minusing your excess cash, I get an enterprise value of $158 billion. So 200 less 150 is roughly 45 or so billion. Well, they paid 70 billion for Aetna. So you're getting it almost for free by buying the stock today. And you have two businesses now that are growing. You've got your Aetna business and you've got the, uh, the, the consumer retail business for uh, CVS. Let's do a couple checks on value metrics. Enterprise value EBITDA and debt ratio to EBITDA. Again, debt is only relevant if it's relative to its ability to be paid. So that's why we use debt to EBITDA. You can see prior to both the capitalization of operating leases and prior to the acquisition of Aetna, this company had a low debt rating. One to two times is a very good credit rating. Uh, kudos for the CFO and the management team of keeping the debt low in this business over, this, over that period of time and being able to grow earnings while the debt was very low. I like that. Then... Strategically, they say, hey, we have to go all in on Aetna. We're going to finance it because it's, it's expensive. It was a healthcare stock. I mean, I, I could see why they paid what they paid. So they borrowed a ton of money and, they, and, and debt went from $30 billion to $90 billion. Okay. My, my debt ratio went from 2 to 5.6. So way over our three times metric. But then it started coming down as they prudently want to get back to what they used to be. So Great job management team, by the way, for going after an acquisition, paying for it, and then having the financial discipline to continue to buy down the debt like they promised. I love that. Great job. That's going to come down. That's going to con continue to come down below our three metrics. So I'm going to give this a pass, even though it's above the three times right now. Given the multi-year trend here of financial discipline, I think us as long-term investors can check the box and say it's going to be less than three times. Enterprise value EBITDA. This is the relative value of how much, how how big is, how, what's the value of the entire business, enterprise value divided by what it makes on an on an operating income or an EBIT or in this case EBITDA basis. This is a relative number. So this is saying that in in times you can see this stock, you can it sells for about eleven times as a high, and maybe here eight. 8.6 to 8.3 is the absolute low historically. Well, right now that stock is trading at eight times. So at 70, it's $70 a share uh, relative to this 19.6 billion of EBITDA that accomplished last fiscal year, you can buy that stock for eight times EBITDA, which is cheaper than it's been in a decade. Uh, very nice little, little um, you talk about a moat, or a cushion or a margin of safety. If you look at a decade of trading history, albeit this is single point in time, right? This is end of fiscal year, but it gives you a broad range. When generally, if you're buying at the bottom of that range on a stock that's issuing growing guidance, beating the numbers, uh, by the way, on their on their earnings call, uh, that bodes really well in in my opinion. So I I'm I'm really interested in this stock. Let's let's keep looking at uh, free cash flow right where the rubber meets the road. Free cash flow from operations adjusted. We on the cash flow club at cashflowinvestingpro.com. Uh, check the link. Hit the link down below by the way for a free cash flow one pager. Sign up for my for my uh, email list. So you've got cash flow from, adjust, we adjust for stock-based compensation and some inventory changes, 5.6 billion in 2013 to 8 billion 
to 8.3 to 9.9, 7.7, 8.5. So cash flow from operations was growing over the long term prior to the acquisition, a little softness at the acquisition point. And then they acquired it, it goes to 12.3, 15.4, 17.8, and then, and then 15.7, a little down last year. But overall, moving in that direction, which is what we wanna see. Overall, 12 times annual growth rate, which dovetails with the growth rate of EBITDA at 8%, acknowledging the fact that both these growth rates are starting pre and post acquisition. So that's a little bit, um, I, I get that's that shifted a little bit. But the point here is that cash flow and EBITDA are both going directionally the same way, which means the accounting team, good job accounting team, are, are expensing expenses properly, or at least it's a smell check. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it's a nice smell check. CapEx in this business has remained relatively flat on all of this. So they've been able to grow Aetna. Aetna's not needing a whole lot of CapEx. Really, the CapEx goes to the, to store locations. Now they were able to lay on new services on top of the existing store network that doesn't take extra CapEx to go do. And I like that. You can see this CapEx every single year is basically $2 billion. So as cash flow from operation grows, this maintains the same. Their cash flow generation expands. And we like that. This channel, we want to take a look at how much money do they make? What's this spread? At the end of last year, the board of directors said we have $15.7 billion of jack that we generated by having customers come into our store, selling them goods and services, fulfilling subs uh, prescriptions, paying our employees, paying rent, paying insurance, bonuses, all that stuff. And at the end of the day, you have $15.7 billion of cash sitting on the balance sheet. What do you do with it? We're gonna pay, take off $2 billion, $2.7 billion, and you're gonna go reinvest in the stores to make sure next year can, you can continue to generate that cash flow. Great, okay. Now I have what, 15.7 minus 2.7, is that $13 billion, mental math late at night, $13 billion of jack that I've reinvested in the stores. Now what do we do? Now what do we have to do? I need to pay my bank back and we promise the shareholders I'm gonna pay down that debt. So I've got 13 billion left. I pay off $4.2 billion, that's $9 billion left of cash. And they've, they've been doing that, by the way, for the last four years running. 5.3 billion, 5.6 billion, 9.2 billion, and 4.2 billion. So they're, they're buying down the debt as aggressively as possible. You're seeing that as the debt balance falls. So then they peel off that and they've got $9 billion of cash. That's this number, free cash flow from operation. This is what businesses are valued on. It's really an argument of what this is gonna be in the future, but this is the number that's valued on. Number of shares outstanding. So you and I don't buy a whole company, certainly not multi-billion dollar ones. We buy shares of companies. So I take this, this value and divide it by your shares and you get on a per share basis. And when you buy the stock, this is your claim your pro rata claim of this cash flow is this number. It's represented by the stock price. In this case, $97 at the time. I divide these two and I get a 7% yield. By the way, so if, if this stock right now is yielding $7, roughly $7 a share, and you can buy the stock for $70 a share, it's a 10% free cash flow yielding business that's growing top line at call it mid single digits. Uh, and earnings with cash flow and falling debt. That's a very compelling, compelling um, opportunity here. And I want to note here the little drop in shares. You might know somewhere in the t-shirt today. That's because this little drop in shares, I'm going to confirm with the cash flow statement, is them buying back stock. So if we go to the cash flow statement uh, on their annual report, 2022 cash flow statement, CVS Health, cash flow from operating activities. We come down $16 billion cash flow from operations. You zip down a little bit before. Here's your nine billion, uh, $2 billion of CapEx. You could be $2 billion, $2.7 billion of CapEx for the purchase of property, plant, and equipment. You zip down below that. Here is your $4.2 billion of debt, long term debt payments, right? 4.2, 10, 15. They've been paying down a lot of debt. Great job. And one more thing, dividends paid, $3 billion of dividends paid. They can easily afford this with all the jack they make every single year. But what I like, what I like the most here is $3.5 billion of repurchase of stock. That, it translates into this stock decline, if I can pull it up, 
and I, this stock decline here from 1.3 billion to 1.28 billion dollars a billion shares outstanding this is what they're doing right now so a they are growing earnings b they are buying down their debt and then as that debt falls and they no longer have to put that cash to work what are they going to do with it they're going to buy back stock that's what they're going to do and i think at this level if if i was the ceo and the cfo and i was saying i have the opportunity to buy my own company at 70 dollars a share i would be buying an absolute metric ton of that stock if I were those guys. So this is the landscape. This gives you 10 years of history. I think you need to ground yourself in whatever you're doing with long-term data because you're buying the stock for the long haul. We have no idea what's going to happen next year. Any forecasting is an absolute guess. The only real truth is what the business has done historically. That's the only hard fact that we know. Everything else is speculation. So now speaking of speculation, let's speculate. Okay, so now we're going to forecast this business. We call it forecast, and they should call it guessing because that's what it is. 5% um, year-over-year growth uh, in EBITDA gets me $20.7 billion, $20 billion of EBITDA. I then grow that at 3% over the long term. Why 3%? Meh, kind of inflation, uh, kind of not 1%, not 5%, some sort of cushion. This business deserves a higher market multiple. As the, uh, the healthcare gets more and more infused, healthcare companies in general trade at a higher multiple than single location, uh, multi-location retail businesses. And I think you're gonna see a market multiple expansion in this business as they successfully, successfully they have to do that, morph into more of a healthcare provider. That's gonna be a stickier business. That stickier business deserves a higher market multiple. So you're gonna get that market multiple expansion from roughly eight times today to 10 times in the future. That's great. So I have $27 billion of EBITDA long-term with some sort of like low to mid single digit EBITDA earnings growth over the long period of time is what we need. You need then, then the, need the market to respect that at a 10 times market multiple. And I get an enterprise value of $272 billion, um, which right now it's trading at $158 billion. So you're getting that nice lift from $158 to $270. That's a $120 billion of extra value that could be generated. Less debt at that time plus cash gives me $180 billion of market cap divided by the fully diluted shares I see. And I get a $140 price target. It's basically doubling, more than doubling what the stock is worth with trading at today. I do the same thing on free cash flow, acknowledging that my cash flow next year is going to be weak as they continue to buy down the shares, but once buy down the debt. But once that debt is paid down, cash flow is going to spike up and we're going to see a lift from roughly $8 to call it $11 of free cash flow. That 11 growing at 3% is going to grow to 13.8 long term at an 8% free cash flow yield. Remember right now it's 10 lower yield, higher stock price, I get a $172 price target out 10 years for CVS based on a free cash flow method. If I average those two methods, I get a free cash flow method, which assumes all cash flows distributed to me. It's an assumption, but it's a way to value security because we don't know what they're going to do with that free cash flow. But if they keep it or if they buy back shares, um, it's all different machinations, but ultimately it would come back to you. I get $172. If I do the EBITDA market multiply $140, average the two for $156. Look in the stock market. What can I buy the stock for today? Lo and behold, I can buy the stock for $70. This is 90 because it was filed a while ago, but I can buy it for 70 bucks. I get this stream of cash flow. I'm out at $156. And what does that generate? Down here, my little distribution chart, which is handy dandy. This stock is trading for roughly 70 bucks. So I'm someplace around 26 to 25% IRR, which is a very, very high return annually over the next decade. That's every single year. If this were to pan out, you would have made 25% on your money every single year for a decade. That is why we give this distribution down to the bottom because who knows what the Mr. Market's going to serve up as a stock price. Um, we look at stocks generally once a year. We'll dust off a one pager, update it, and use it as a guide. Uh, but if the stock, when the stock price moves, sometimes this market throws away great stocks. I think that's what's going on here. Uh, they are throwing away a really, really compelling value case. And that's why, as I said at the outset of this video, 
I think you can buy CVS today and get Aetna for free. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. This is Rational Investing, where we hunt for free cash flow, we buy long term, we hold equities, we are prudent, rational, thoughtful investors, at least we try. Let's recap the five key attributes in the stock. Number one, top line revenue growth. Yes, it's growing. Number two, EBITDA. EBITDA is growing. Number three, strong free cash flow. Yes. Number four, low debt. Yeah, we're checking the box because in a couple years it will be below three times. And number five, is it well priced? Absolutely, it's well priced, in my opinion, on my vlog for personal channel. Do your own due diligence, seek fin professional financial advice. Um, I, I think it's a very compelling value case. Again, trading risk versus reward here. You can buy a company that's growing with low debt, strong free cash flow, that could have a potential of generating plus 20% return every year for a decade. That is a very interesting, compelling story. I'm also wearing, as you can tell, the Trifecta t-shirt. That's a special case that we lay on top of stocks that made all five criteria. This basically means that the shares are being repurchased. The market multiple is expanding from, five, from eight to 10 and the earnings are growing. Watch my Domino's versus Google video for more detail here. You'll see why Domino's <clears throat> after the IPO outperformed Google over the last 16 years when they both IPO'd in the same year. Domino's outperformed Google because it paid a dividend, which you reinvested. The company bought back shares, they grew earnings, and they expanded their market multiple. That created something like a 5,000% return, beating Google's. Even though Google grew its earnings substantially over that period of time, it IPO'd at a high multiple, it never bought back any shares, and its multiple remained the same level today as it was at the IPO. So you never got the market multiple expansion. Be careful what you buy, right? Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Yes, there are phenomenal companies out there, but if everybody knows them, they're probably fully valued. You wanna find a company that nobody's looking at or the market has got it wrong. That is how you can make some serious jack in this market, in my opinion. Take a look at this. If you like this kind of work, I highly recommend you check out my website, cashflowinvestingpro.com. You can A, sign up for the email list. I put out some interesting content. Uh, B, in the description below, you can download a free one-pager if you want to see what this looks like. We do McDonald's as a free one-pager. Uh, or if you want to join the Cashflow Club, we have a series of analysts that produce of reports covering over 150 stocks on the stock market, and we release one pages like this that highlight true cash flow generating opportunities. Lastly, if you want to learn how to do this on your own, I do teach a course. I have taught hundreds of analysts in my career as a CFO, and I've taught hundreds of people via online course, which is very simple, but it walks you through how to fundamentally build a long-term Excel model uh, for all the stocks you own, how to read the 10Ks and pull the information out. It's a great foundational um, uh, 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 course that you can use for the rest of your life. I highly recommend you check it out. All right, uh, thank you very much for uh, watching. Please hit the subscribe button, share on social media, it always helps, and uh, throw a comment down below for the old Google algo, uh, it always helps out. Let me know what else you'd like to see, I'm happy to take recommendations. My name is Cameron Stewart, this is Rational Investing, thank you so much for watching, take care, bye-bye.